Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to the April meeting of the uh, Phillips Town Conservation Board. Um, we don't have minutes completed, so we're going to skip over that for the moment. Um, in terms of correspondence, um, we received, what was the name of the Phillips Brook project? Was that the house where they did not put in a rain garden? Oh. Um, which Max and I are going to have to look at. They were supposed mm -hmm. to put, it was that little um, sort of mid-century style house where they expanded the garage and put it in an upstairs. And they have a yeah, rain the, barrel. The lessers? Yeah. Mm. And they have a rain barrel, which they think is a... About yeah. the same. So, so I think we're going to have to have them come in yep. in May. Okay. With that said, let's um, go first to uh, Boscoville. Okay. Okay. And before you present your plan, I had sent an email um, to Boscobel saying that there were three deficiencies in the permit. Um, and it's not the end of the world, but we do want it to be complied properly upon next time. You know, the first was we're supposed to have a minimum of five days notice that uh, application was going to be done, not 24 hours. Well, first I'll say hello, and I'm Jennifer Carl, the executive director of Bell, and I want to thank you so much for the Conservation Board's uh, real partnership and Max's throughout this meadow process. My understanding is today we were invited to give an annual report, um, and uh, there were some questions sent to us in advance that we responded to in advance. We didn't really hear a response to our response. No, but no. The, the, the bottom line is the, the three deficiencies were, you know, proper notice was not given, which is very important. We had asked uh, for quite a while and were not given, you know, specifications from we think of what they're licensed to do. Because when you look at the New York State mm -hmm. pesticide portal, they're only showing right of way. Once we had their registration number, we were able to look it up. And this is probably a problem with the state. They are also registered for turf and ornamentals as well as a clinic. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. In terms of notification, again, we should have been, Conservation Board should have been contacted because we had talked about notice in the local papers. Notice uh, in the local papers. The papers about the project mm -hmm. and what was being done. Uh -huh. It's very different than you going to your membership list. Why? Mm -hmm. um, I can't say one is more efficient than the other, but I can say your membership um, would be more cherry picking rather mm. than the general public. Well, for general so. public notification, we used a road sign on 9D, and it, you'd mm. certainly get more readership than but you do in the local but paper again, on our road signs. We have a specific mm. permit. If you want to change something, you need to come back to I it. I so appreciate that. Okay. Um, our understanding, mm -hmm. it was that the request um, and, uh, you know, something that we're excited about, the whole purpose for this meadow is, and it's an educational purpose. And so the process of the meadow is very important to us. We want to share that with the public in a way that even inspires other homeowners and institutions to engage with self-propagating landscapes. So we're doing that in many, many ways. Um, my understanding was that um, that you know you had said ad in the paper. We would love to have press coverage. We would love to have more presence in the paper, and it's sharing the full breadth of that project. So we're doing that through road signs, e blasts, um, uh, you know, talking to neighbors. Yes, sending out you know letters to our membership, but it's far broader than that. Our e blast list it's sixteen thousand people I, I, I that far exceeds the newsletter. Right. Yeah. I, I understand, but basically, when you're issued a wetlands permit, right. You know, it is a legal document. Mm -hmm. And we do expect to have compliance, compliance to it. Makes total if sense. you want to change something, you just need to request such. It's I just so it's, that. it's a procedural requirement. Right. Yeah. That's that's essentially what it is. And maybe we can follow up with the office too about what exactly that format looks like that you'd like to see and happy to do that going forward. Um, we're very excited about all of the range of public programming that we're developing with groups like uh, the Hudson Highlands Land Trust, uh, the Garden Conservancy with the Phillips Town Garden Club. We're planning a fall meadow symposium, which will be a public event really to, to talk about the process. Lots of different meadow projects are going on in the community and there's a lot of public interest in that. So this process has helped us inform that symposium and I'm so glad you're supportive of getting the word out because that's exactly the whole purpose of the program. 
So thank you. I, if I may, I'm going to introduce um, Leah Emery, who you've heard from before. She's handled some of that correspondence that you sent in advance. And yeah. we've got our team from um, Larry Weiner also to help us. So, so feel free. Thanks thank for you. moving us up on <laughs> too. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think Jennifer answered um, really most of the questions about the questions that we got in advance and then what we answered. And so I'll just ask right now, um, since we have the time, you just want a classified ad with the scope of the Meadow Project, um, right? I would think a small display ad rather than a classified ad. Okay, because it just says ad in the permit, right. so a display ad. Right. Okay, all right, because they're very different, yeah. Right. And if you have any sample <clears throat> of what you'd like us to follow, happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I think Jennifer well answered as well. We, we definitely did not just send to our membership. We sent to, you know, 29,000 households, but completely understand. Um, and then in terms of advance notice, uh, I, it seems like you, you've seen what we sent in, so yeah. I don't think we need to, okay. All right, any other questions about those? No. Issues in the no. questions? Okay. Chris? Good evening. Um, good to see you all again. My name is Chris Charpin. I'm the Fuel Operations Manager at Larry Renor Landscape Associates. I'm heading the meadow preparation over at Boscobel. Um, I was asked to guide you all through our annual report that we submitted in December. Do you, does everyone have it in front of them, or should I act as if we don't? Or is it? Or how, how would you like me to present this? Yeah, we don't have it. In front you of don't have it in front of you. Oh, okay. Well, how about I just go through the items in the that we, yeah, that and we I, submitted? I, I, I think that would be fine as okay. well as you know what your successes were, what you think your deficiencies are. Yeah, you know because you're not getting this done in a year. We're not getting this right. done in a year. Right. What do you mean? In other words, this is an ongoing process. So oh, 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 oh. we're going to be yeah, permitting yeah. next year and so on. So you know what worked, what might not have worked, and how yeah. you're going forward. Let's some right. hand out the schedules we have yeah. yep so we produced updated schedules for how we anticipate the remainder of preparation and also what was performed last fall after that permit was granted absolutely better So in terms of timeline, I think that's the best place to start. Um, the filter sock around the pond extents and also to the inlet area was installed in September um, pre before the first herbicide application, which was performed September 26th. Thank you, Leah. Um, that the results of that application um, are very encouraging in terms of control of our target species and uh, effects on non-target species. Um, based on site observations today, there um, we, we've uh, achieved great control, and especially in the turf areas, the slope, uh, as expected, had many layers of invasive vegetation, which was quite a bit of. Um, uh, creeping euonymus that's still in there and, and um, seeing some mugwort come back in. So um, we're expecting, as expected, uh, additional applications will be needed. However, those applications will be used as necessary in areas that we anticipate the need to, to follow up spray and not just spray for the sake of spraying. Um, so moving into this, oh, so uh, moving backward in December, um, the Boscobel team cleared that slope after the vegetation had senesced um, using um, mechanical methods and chipping a lot of the material um, and on site to keep the, any, any propagules from spreading it to any other sites. So that was performed in December. The slope on the uh, east side along 90, which had hosted the majority of the invasive, sorry. Behind the brick wall. Behind the brick wall, exactly. So that slope, um, was cleared of, of invasive vegetation. Uh, all the trees remained. Um, that poor pine did fall, I think, last week, which is very sad. Yeah. Um, so moving into to this, this year, um, our planned 
Second application would be um, dismay when the seed bank and additional vegetation that was not controlled during the first spray starts to express themselves and, and green up and are actively growing. Um, so that application would be performed in May. And the third application, which would be the final prep application, would be performed in the later part of June um, to, to spot out any, anything that we that may have missed or that is pernicious and subsisting, especially on that slope. Um, and that leads us to the expiration of our permit on June 22nd. So upon renewal, um, we would look to seed the meadow in July of this year. Um, and that would include a light scarification of the soil um, with a mechanical power rate that just scratches the top half inches of soil and kind of turns everything over to create a seed bed and then just broadcast seeding of the whole project area. Um, following the seeding, um, would take, would, uh, we would observe and see um, kind of what's coming back in, what's being germinate, if we have any. Um, usually you get a flush of annual weeds, regardless of how well you prep the meadow, you'll get annual weeds that come in, excuse me. Um, so we've, we've planned a, a mow in September to try to deal with that, cut it over the top, anything that's growing really fast, anything that's up over like a foot in September, if you see it in July, it's going to be a fast growing annual, like a rotorol disturbance species that you don't want in there. And those quickly fall away. Um, so we, and then we have the, a management spray in September um, if we do have any persisting perennial vegetation that we want to just try to nip in the bud um, as after we've seeded this. Additionally, we plan to perform the live plantings, which is um, entirely perennials um, within the meadow areas, just um, outcrops of, of perennials, and that would happen this fall. Um, and then if necessary, perform a, um, another mow in November before things shut down for the year. So that said, I can kind of go backwards and now bring us through um, our annual report per the permits um, recommendation, recommend, or not recommended um, items that needed to be submitted. So the first item in the, in the annual report are photo points. Um, we, part of our, um, our uh, application process was submitting a 34 photo points and um, conditions and, and vegetation and management plan for vegetation in, in those areas. We um, brought that down to 14 for the photo points, but have uh, photo, we've submitted photographs. Sorry, I lost my report here. We submitted photographs for those 14 points for, when, for what they look like in June um, prior to any work being done and then what they looked like in December after the first spray and after that uh, slope was cleared. So those are... That was in the, yeah, it was submitted a few months ago? Yeah, it's not in this, it's not in this packet, it was in... You want it? A previous packet. It was attached as an email to the room. Yes. Thank you. And it's sitting on our website. So additionally, we have the spray report from Weeds Inc. of September 27th um, with all of the approved herbicides and start and end time. And then the uh, soil and water samples from WSP, which is an environmental consulting agency. I'm sure you're familiar with them. They took two um, sediment and surface water samples from the pond surroundings and the pond itself, excuse me, uh, and tested those before and after each uh, the application to see look for remnants um, of the two active ingredients of the two herbicides we used. So the results for those samples, the, the um, First the, first so the samples were taken September 20th, the spray happened September 27th, and then the second sample was taken October 19th. So the tested the soil for triclopyr glyphosate and a, a glyphosate metabolite called AMPA, and then the water was tested for triclopyr and glyphosate, and all results came in uh, under the LOQ, which is the limit of quantification, basically undetected um, with the tools that they were able to use to measure. What's the limit of detection? For each, 
Hold on here. So the LOQ for triclop here is below two micrograms per liter. The LOQ for glyphosate um, is below 0 0.01 micrograms per liter. Mil sorry, milligrams per liter, excuse me. Take me back to chemistry. So small, small numbers. So, so all of those samples came back negative for um, those compounds in the surface water and the sediment before and after the application. And those reports are submitted in that, in that annual report. Um, lastly are, is the avian survey. So um, Boscobel approached the uh, Autobahn, the Putnam Highlands Autobahn Society, who do annual counts um, each year and um, approach them to perform additional annual counts beyond the Christmas count. Um, that, that we have the data for the Christmas count and the, the year eBird observations in the report. An additional um, Christmas count happened Ju January 2nd, so after the report was submitted. I have some stats. So the January 23 count counted 26 species, 233 individuals. This is on Bosco Road. So. Yeah. Correct. And then the total 2023 species count is 61. The January 24 bird count counted 25 species, 354 individuals. And obviously the 2024 species count is still ongoing. Um, Boscobel is working with Sean Camilleri to um, perform additional counts this season um, in addition to that, that Christmas count that happened in, in January. In terms of the um, invertebrate survey, Lee is going to speak to that. They've been doing their best. Jennifer will have to correct me on this one, but West Point has come for a long, long time and done um, amphibian surveys, especially turtles. <laughs> so we've got a lot of data on that, and, and they continue to come and, and do those periodically. Yeah. So that was um, Yeah, so that's the, the final item in the report that we submitted in December. Happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Comments, questions? I have a question. Um, it's not really a point of question. It's, it's an actual question. Didn't we discuss moving the herbicide treatments till after breeding season? Does anybody remember that? But during the site visit, I remember discussing it. I don't remember exactly what we said. Okay, so with that said, um, Scott, when when does breeding season end? I, I would say, what would you say? Would you say probably by mid June? Mid or July, probably. Yeah. Maybe a totally finished if they have second, second and third. I suppose okay. that's true. So then, with this we're talking about, you know, the renewal of the application. That's right. So you're suggesting the herbicide application mid July for what would? Cool. No. Yeah, it's, it's basically for this May. Year, yeah, May. May and, and June. June or early. I mean, do, do we had that conversation? I think the counterpoint was birds aren't nesting in mown turf mm -hmm. anyway. And I don't know where, I remember that coming up too, and, and I right. leave it up to your discretion. Well, I mean, it, it's a conversation to have, and, and it's herbicide, not insecticide. Um, but what kind of impact would it have on the breeding birds? Because that's peak breeding bird season. Mm -hmm. I would say late, I would say probably have a higher impact as this project progresses and becomes more of a usable habitat space. Um, in my opinion, I think when we initially, when the board voted on it, they voted on the the management scheme that was presented to them in terms of timing, um, from what I recall. Max, is that when we also had the discussion about how, about the, the physical action of how we were spraying and the nozzles that we used and the, the fact that we were never broadcast spraying, we were, do you remember? 
I don't know the terminology. He, the, well, the, you were broadcast when, spraying in the larger areas. There's just no way to get around. Well, that. with a very um, short nozzle and dye so that we could see if it... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I feel like that's... I don't want to speak for Scott, but I feel like he's talking more about this being bird food. Right, like so. They, well, it's yeah, they, like, they, you have to worry about the bird food right. being contaminated. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I, I know I brought it up the during the cast. during the um, yeah the the site visit. We talked about it. I mean, we didn't come to any conclusions. I think at the time you said it's easy enough to bump. We would try not to. We could move it so that. It, but my memory for what happened three days ago is not great. <laughs> But Max's point is a really good one, I think. Like right now, that may not be the issue that it will be when it actually is great habitat. Because there's nobody nesting there now. This is, well, right. there's just there's nothing to eat there. There's, right? it's, it's all dead. Yeah. And, yeah. Another. But it's a good, really good point, Scott, for future. Exactly. And in terms and of future management, we typically um, perform spot sprays after the middle of June, and, so, and usually starting middle of June, early July into the late summer. So that would be year three, right after you've planted, to start doing that. I mean, which makes sense, I would say. Scott, could yeah. I ask, what would you recommend as the avoiding going forward? Well, May and June would definitely be avoided if we're yeah, trying to. So the start of the don't spray starts when? May. May or April 5th, or what, what would you? Yeah, I would, I would, as soon as the insects come out, until, um, until, Probably July one. This year I think was to like be safe. I mean, we're trying to minimize. We're not trying to eliminate it. I would think whatever the impact is, but I would say at least till July, July one. Yeah. You know, are, right. I was just thinking about the first brood, but yeah. lots of these birds will have second broods, especially if there's a failure. So starting, you're saying starting from so from ideally from May one to. Leah, are you might need to come up to the mic just to if you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I I'd love to be mindful. Right. And especially as you said, we want this to be a habitat. So we, I'd love to work with you on like let's actually define what's that period to make sure that we're not, you know, that we're we're incorporating that in the maintenance plan. If going I was forward. designing it without doing any further research right now, I would say yeah. um, the closer you can get to July one, the better off you'd be. Okay. Not, not May, not June. Not May, not June. Okay. Thanks. But, yeah, Thanks. it's very sustainable. But the question becomes, and I'm going to rely on you, Scott, as well as uh, Max, right? Um, from a, I hate to use the word eradication, but it is the eradication standpoint. It does make sense what they want to do I now, that, yeah. right? But so, w so birds that are not nesting, what type of danger do you feel there might be? And the literature with glyphosate is all over the place. Um, in terms of any birds that might be looking for seed or insect, if they're going to say, it would be insect them. that I'd be more worried about, um, and and even insects. Well, you know, it, it if there's if there's no evidence of stuff going downstream, then it's not that much of a problem right there. If there's evidence of of impact being felt downstream, then there's lots of birds that are not in that area that are, that are still relying on aquatic insects and things like that. What are your target invasives during those those months? What are you looking at spray? Yeah, so the um, Ioannis returnii on that slope, which is under um, a lot of that vegetation, is um, it's it's kind of looks like vinca um, at this time in the season. That is what we're predominantly going for, and then there's quite a bit of mugwort um, that's coming back in, in which takes usually takes a number of applications. That's a really pernicious weed. Uh, and then namely whatever comes in in the seed bank. Um, right now there's a lot of nowhere maple seedlings coming in, which will just get mown over because those are um, dealt with uh, kind of that way. And then, and then just observing what comes in over the next month or so before that first application and, and acting accordingly. Is it still efficacious to spray for those things in July? Not necessarily because there's a cool season rationale to this prep spray. Okay. Um, if you miss that window, then... How about April? On there. April, that, I mean, I think I really would want to stick to our methodology in terms of prep to make sure that we get the best 
to be able to, to implement the best landscape possible that will act as habitat that will hopefully be as minimal ma maintenance as possible moving forward. I think it's, my opinion is that it's the best to keep this uh, timeline um, just so that I think effectiveness in the long term will hopefully have reduced impact on what will be hopefully be a habitat that does have many nesting birds. A couple of years, April will be nesting season anyway. Right, that's true. Um, and like I said, we typically perform management tasks, uh, especially chemical management tasks later in the season. Um, so that's, that's kind of practice as it is. But in terms of prep, we really want to make sure that we, especially in um, areas that were previously turf, they host a lot of cool season plants because that's kind of what thrives there, is, like, it's including the grasses. Um, so we really want to make sure we get that application because I've seen quite a few meadows that you see and then all of a sudden you see a lot of clover and um, turf grass come back in and then it becomes very difficult to get it back from that point. Other questions, comments? On this year's plan? Mm -hmm. I have a weird idea related to what you're talking about. <laughs> I was going to say, because why are you looking at me? I'm going I'm I'm to float this and it may be completely ridiculous. But if we're talking about having that area, like, you know, if, if we've got birds that may go in there and eat and get poisoned, right, because of the, the spray this season. Is there a way that you can net over that area so birds can't get in there and get at those insects and protect them and still have the schedule be the same or no? I think it's too extensive. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Too, too much. Also, also, you're netting. You're netting nothing. I mean, I, I mean, it's it's not happening. I also like encourage looking at the labels for these products and how they actually do affect invertebrates, and then and then. Um, in a similar fashion as we've discussed in the past, how they quickly bind to the plant material and we don't spray enough for runoff to occur, so it gets locked up pretty quick. Um, right. and, and like you said, they're herbicides, they're not insecticides. If we were spraying insecticide, I would, this would be much more of a concern yeah. to me. Um, okay, so that that's, was just my... That's, no, yeah. that's the crazy Thinking idea outside the, the box, I like okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> or we can fly a drone over to disturb right. everybody. I'm basically... I'm assuming most of the work is going to be done with glyphosate. Yes. What we, are you dealing so with the woody vegetation that's still that's exists. still triclopyr on that slope that you want to miss? We're going to want okay. to hit with the triclopyr. And then what about mugwort? Mugwort, um, glyphosate. Okay. And then a, a majority of those cool season weeds is also glyphosate, uh, meaning what's in the existing turf grass. <laughs> Did you ever consider a side machine to just peel it all off there without using chemicals? And yeah. then, then do, do the weeding after of the odds and ends of residuals? Yeah, I mean, at that scale, scraping is a monumental task. It's, mo it's a monumental expense, and you all have all this material, and it's also prohibitively expensive. Um, we've, we've run the numbers for, for sod removal it's at that scale. It's also how chemicals you see. That's true. Yeah, that's the whole idea. Yeah. Um, and, and the... What, it, what was existing on that slope wouldn't be conducive to that method. But um, and for small meadows, sod removal is a great strategy. So, you know, weather, weather aside, when would, num well, you're calling it number two herbicide application for the 2024. When in May? Do you think you would do it? This is the, it's the this is the tricky part. Where it depends on what kind of spring we have. I think right. we're shooting for around the fifteenth, so that just the right in the middle of May. If things um, if we start moving into an early summer, we'll, we'll likely push that forward. And if it stays kind of cool like this and nighttime temperatures stay low, we'll probably push that a little bit back. However, we will provide ample notice. So what are the thoughts of the board on renewing this tonight versus pushing it which to May, which might um, be problematic, depending on how the weather is? I mean, it's like, problematic because the permit goes through June, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to see a complete 
plan in front of us before we approve it. You know, the, com the complete management plan, rather than approving well, something we, tonight. On, okay, I mean, yeah. we pretty much have that from last year. Yeah, yeah. just the schedule's different. Yeah, it's yeah. the schedule that's yeah. changed somewhat. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. May I ask for clarification on uh, the report? Would you? You have to go yeah, to the sure. microphone. Thank you. It's for tall people. <laughs> <laughs> um, my concern has always been the glyphosate, among other things, but also uh, the runoff into the water. And I'm looking at your report. I just want to understand it a little better because it's not November, September 20th and uh, October 19th. Was that before the first application? So was this a baseline? The September 20th yeah. sample is yeah. the baseline. The application occurred on the 27th of September. And then the second sample is post. There is a permit required a baseline and a measure after. Right. Right. right, so um, I'm also curious, why was the sampling taken at the most rapid areas of the pond, where you have water flushing in and water flushing out? Uh, there were no samples indicated that were like in the sediments that were in the center of the pond where it's quiet. That's an interesting question. I would have to reach out to them and get back to you okay. on the rationale for that. Uh, this is what, this is, they're, they're an established firm and I imagine that there was rationale to Okay, because that would, affect, of course, affect the, well, you know, the concentrations if well, it's moving by quickly, as opposed, you know, flushing through, as opposed to being a sediment. So, well, and the water it, circulates through quite quickly. Right, that pond, it does. Right? So, and then <laughs> in, in, in some of the areas. samples on either end would give you a pretty... And the after sample was three weeks after the application? Approximately. Is that or standard? Does anybody know? Weeks, I think. And, um, and I, you may have said it, I apologize if you did. Um, there's going to be more water sampling as you go along, or this is it? Yes, we are under our, the permit we are required to. Do you know approximately when? Like, will it be, I mean, it's been seven months. I saw the blue, the blue-green socks. Uh, there's just been a major disturbance by that beautiful white pine coming down. Um, so all of this is disturbing soil, disturbing things that are going on there. Um, I'd like to ask that, if possible, before the second application, there be another water test so we know baseline again what has happened since that first application before you go into a second application. I, I'd make the argument that there's been actually very little soil disturbance apart from the, that pine falling, which is a that's one. Natural. That's recent, and, you yeah. know. But there's been a tremendous amount of water. There were the water socks. Oh, and you saw, mean with all the storms? Yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. You know, in terms of runoff, like, you know. Right. My point is that in seven months, there's probably a very different water sample, or there should be. If the water sample comes out exactly the same as it did before you started, I'd be very, very surprised. So, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just asking as a, you know, concerned citizen that maybe you know, monitoring that water because as we've pointed out, that water goes down to Constitution Marsh and then out to the Hudson River. Absolutely. So it's very nice that the macro species are doing well, but we don't know what's happening in the water. There, you know, so. Well, I'd argue that we do based on the, the samples. But you're saying on more, on more of an ongoing basis. Minimal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically the sampling is being done to look for specific contaminants and metabolites from the herbicides and no more. It's yeah, well, this sample, like no, I'm just. A complete this, water chemistry. this sample was on the chemicals. It was chemical concentration. Right. I of don't know of any other sampling of that was done. Specific um, so. trichopyr, I assume, is just the compound yeah. and for uh, glyphosate because it breaks down very quickly. There are certain metabolites that are right. used as markers. So, as I say, I'm just you know concerned that we continue to monitor and that we know you know, really what's going on there and, and should there need, be re, need for uh, some sort of remediation or, or extra care, we know about it before it happens, you know. I don't know the DEC, you know, establishments. I don't know what they said as, as safety guidelines, the concentrations. You know, I don't know what that is, but I see that in some areas the glyphosate's five times what it is in other areas according to the, it's, uh, if you look, well, I can show you later if you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. in, bo in both samples, in soil and water, glyphosate and um, and the breakdown uh, element was were undetectable. Yeah, 
Yeah, they it's were not it's detected. it's minimal, so but were, it went from were, it they went were from based point... on the best the, what, what sensors they had access to, they right. were undetected. So there was no well, it went from point zero one to point zero five. Can I can I take a look here? Sure, be my guess. It's you know here's point zero, and, I, and it may be just understanding. Yeah, the yeah. Report, so, so this is the this is the LOQ number. It's basically the right. threshold that they can that they can observe through their um, right. senses. Sensors. And then when you look over here, it's it's. Here it is. Yeah, it's so up that, here. It's so five fold, it's five is that's for much. soil, and then the other one is for right, water. So right. they're just different numbers that of the uh, concentrations that they can recognize okay. in soil samples and water samples. Right. But the results for all of them are LOQ, which means they were under that requirements. Number. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully that helps. Yes. <laughs> so, so question. Does anybody who know, who knows better than I do uh, have an opinion about uh, how long after the application there should be samples? Because clearly, to, to sample soil and water a month after, or two months after, or three months after, might not be as useful as measuring a week after, or mm -hmm. two days after. Depends on the degradation rate. I mean, that's something that's, I'm sure there's references there. I mean, I, honestly, I think you'd have to design a, a sampling protocol based on liter a literature re review of like you know, what Bob was alluding to. Right. So what, whatever the board was comfortable with at the time, I think, was followed. Um, if it needs to be more extensive, then we would need to ask. Well, I don't know if we specified it at, at the time. Maybe we said before and after, but, you know, and, and it could be perfectly fine. I, I have no idea. That's why I'm asking if there's anybody, you know, I'm not a pesticide app. We would have to come up with a hypothesis that they need to follow, um, I think, or they would have to present one to, to us with a, a literature review based on those two chemicals. And I also just wanted to ask for an experiment to be done, but we were for like typical monitoring to be done. So like whatever the protocol for typical monitoring would be, if there's a reference for that, that would be, you know, ideal. Right. I mean, you can go beyond that and do some experimentation and try and come up yeah, with yeah, a no, protocol. Not, but yeah, no, I'm not the experiment. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's just, yeah. it seems something that somebody ought to be paying attention right. to. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if any best practices exist, but I think right. when you come in, I assume you're going to come in next month rather than June for the renewal. Yes. Right? So I think what makes sense, um, I think Scott brings up a good point. I think a simple way to do it is there is definitely literature. I don't know if it's on the label itself, you know, for both triclopyr and glyphosate, you know, how long it takes them to break down. You know, glyphosate breaks down relatively quickly and binds to soil particles. That's what it was designed to do. Right. The literature is anywhere from two days to over 100 days. Right. The, the rule of thumb for both of them is about 45 days as the half-life. And, and it's a little bit different depending on if you're talking about soil or water. Right. Because water is... So, so refresh my memory. Yeah. When was the, the testing done post... Uh, two and a half weeks. Two and yeah. a half weeks. So that's actually... So we just took the that's reasonable. We is it? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's reasonable. It would be, if opinion. it was in the sediment, it would be very detected, yeah. detectable at that point. Right. Because it would be, it wouldn't have, um, I mean, it would likely be on the faster end of that metabolism, but it wouldn't have approached, it maybe would have approached a half-life, so there would be 50% of the, right. that compound in the soil. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, we appreciate you coming in, and... Uh, We'll see you next month to uh, renew. We Thank you. We appreciate the advice and interest. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK. Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival. Hi, good evening. Adam Stellaro for uh, Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival. Um, also with me here tonight are Jan uh, Johannesson, who's our wetlands expert, and Glenn Watson, who's our project engineer. Um, so since uh, the meeting last month, we made a couple of submissions to the board. Um, one was an April 4th letter from Margaret McManus from Beatty Watson um, regarding the drainage design for the project. And in finalizing the drainage design, um, Beatty Watson realized that there needed to be some additional um, water filtration put in that was going to increase uh, slightly by 360 square feet the um, 
the disturbance to the wetland buffer area. Um, the letter describes uh, the, the units that are being put in. They're on the south side of the, um, the Route 9 entrance. Um, fortunately, we were able to work on the, um, on the grading plan so that we were able to shave off an equal amount on the north side of the driveway in terms of the total disturbance. So there's no net increase in the total disturbance that we're seeking under the permit, still 17,090 square feet. Um, the, and, and that's uh, shown on the updated plan set that was submitted to the board. Um, we also submitted yesterday a revised mitigation and monitoring plan to the board. Um, so I know that was just submitted yesterday and you may not have a chance to review that yet, um, but the changes that we made to the mitigation and monitoring plan were made in coordination with our, you know, through conversations with town staff. Um, and the updates specifically address a, a few points that were raised um, by the board and staff, which were um, number one, how to measure success uh, of the mitigation plan, um, not only in terms of the success of the plantings around the edge of the pond, but also in terms of um, how successful the project is at removing invasive species. And so the monitoring plan specifies, you know, an 85% survival rate for the native plantings that are going in and, uh, you know, holding invasive species to 15%. To so that's, those are both calculated in terms of, you know, the area that we're looking to address in the mitigation plan. And that will be part of our annual report that we submit along with, um, with photo points so that the board can see how, um, how successful the, uh, the plan is. Um, another point that we addressed in the updated plan was, you know, what happens if we're not meeting the criteria for success? Um, and we talk about, you know, the need to, uh, you know, after year one sort of measuring and deciding, you know, what needs to be replanted or what additional steps need to be taken in terms of addressing invasives. The plan also um, includes justification for why particular species were chosen in terms of being able to outcompete invasives um, and includes more detail about when and how herbicides would be used. Um, the, the primary method for removing invasives is still going to be um, manual removal, um, but um, in particular for mugwort, um, and we just spent a, lot, a long time talking about how hard it is to get rid of mugwort. So the plan specifies that um, if herbicides are, are going to be used, that they would probably be used on mugwort and Japanese honeysuckle. Um, the good news is that there aren't a ton of invasives in terms of the current mix that exists outside of the pond. The, the planting zone is still sort of um, gravelly and there aren't a lot of plants in it now. So what we'll be planting into is um, is pretty much free from invasives. But what we talked about with staff was, was including a 10 foot buffer beyond the planting zone in which we're looking at to remove invasives to begin with so that the invasives from the upland portion next to the pond don't start creeping down um, into the pond and competing with the plants that we've just planted. So we've added that to the plan. Um, we have not tried to quantify the square footage. I mean, it's a 10 foot border, but because there aren't invasives you know, in every single square foot of that 10 foot buffer, we haven't added that to the square footage of mitigation, but obviously that will, you know, that 10 foot buffer is going to greatly increase um, the square footage of total mitigation um, in terms of the ratio between disturbance to, to mitigation. Um, and then we also, um, talking to staff, talked about erosion control for the work that's gonna be done in the planting zone and and in the buffer area to make sure that soil isn't getting washed out of those areas and into the pond. So we've added into the plan, um, adding uh, core logs um, around the, you know, the edge of the pond so that we're making sure that soil isn't washing into the pond when we're doing the mitigation work. Um, so we, you know, we expect that you'll review the plan and have questions and we'll, you know, continue to work with, with staff to address those. Uh, questions as the application proceeds. I'm not sure if anybody has any comments or questions at this moment. Yeah. Late submission. This, this is a lot of stuff yeah. to go through. And I, 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 I didn't see this until I walked in here tonight. 
because and I, I really don't have the room even to by, even by email you didn't receive it until uh, yeah I, I don't have the room to really look okay. at this and I don't know how the rest of you so, guys feel but so okay so let's let's just talk procedurally a little bit there's a public hearing in roughly 10 days <clears throat> um, in my opinion and this is my opinion I think that Truthfully, the function of the Conservation Board section of that public hearing is to get public comment on this. Yep. Um, uh, I probably make sense, time allowing, that you present the mitigation plan, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how do the three of you feel about that? I think that makes right. sense. I mean, I was sort of hoping we'd be a little bit further ahead but we're not, we haven't looked at the plan, and I'm sure there are some changes. I do have a big question, though, because I did glance at it. Um, and it's not whether I'm for or against. Um, you're trying to repopulate a newly made emergent zone because the pond was lowered by four feet because of the dam. And I think there are going to be questions that come up from the public on this. Um, is that the best solution? Would it have been better, you know, from an ecological standpoint to repair the dam or not? I, I'm just warning you of what I think might come up because when I started just speed reading this, you know, one of my thoughts is, you know, emergent zone makes great sense, the larger buffer is great, and so on. Um, but is it the best way to go about this? I mean, what is the long term condition of the pond going to be? with a lower water level, I assume the pond is not that deep. I can't really speak to that. Right. Um, but so I'm just sort yeah. of forewarning you. I have a feeling right. that's going to come up. So, I mean, what I can say, you know, at this point is that that pond did not have, you know, a native habitat around it. It was essentially a golf course feature mm -hmm. um, that we are trying to turn into habitat. Um, and to deal with that lowered edge of the pond as, as an opportunity to create habitat that did not exist before. Okay. Is there anything um, that anybody would like to present quickly to us in terms of the mitigation plan? Or do you feel it's, we're better served just reading this? I would um, be happy to walk you through it if you think that would be beneficial. I'd I love it. Um, okay, then I think if you'd like to do it, I think you should. You're here. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, good evening. Uh, Jan Trahanison, uh, KSCJ Consulting, um, the, um, the client's uh, wetland professional. We uh, delineated the wetlands as part of the project and as the author of the environmental impact statement. Um, we prepared in consultation with Nelson Birdwaltz this uh, wetland mitigation and monitoring plan. Realize you just received it yesterday. I can completely understand that you have not had time to review it, but uh, I'm happy to just kind of give you broad brush tonight and maybe some things that we talk about tonight will help you as you, you uh, dive into it. Um, so there's just a, a brief introduction to the project and how we got here and what we've done through SECRA. Uh, there's a site description um, of the property and, and um, the wetland that we're focusing on, the fact that we did delineate it, that the wetland boundary was confirmed by the town. It gets into a little bit of jurisdiction. Just to uh, reiterate, this is a local wetland. Um, there is a New York State DEC Class B TS stream that flows through um, the pond. Uh, the pond is certainly regulated by the Army Corps, um, but we're not disturbing the pond. We're not dredging the pond. We're not disturbing the bottom sediments. Uh, so we do not need any permitting through the DEC uh, or the Army Corps as part of the project. So in terms of wetland permitting, we're here before you for a local wetland permit, and that's the extent of the, lo uh, of the wetland permitting for the project. Um, the mitigation plan is really a threefold approach. Um, we are, there's two greens, former golf, co uh, golf course greens that are adjacent to the pond. 
Um, we've identified as, as during the seeker process that the top sediments of those greens have some contamination associated with the former golf course use. Uh, we submitted as part of this uh, yesterday's submission a soils management plan that was prepared by Geo Design. Um, that gets into the weeds on, on how they're going to go about removing those sediments, but it's certainly mitigation. We're going to remove those top sediments. They're going to be removed from the site in a lawful, ma lawful manner and, and brought to a, a facility that deals with those, those type of soils. Um, then we're going to kind of regrade those greens into a more natural type um, feature and they'll get uh, seeded with a native seed mix. Um, if you're driven by, you can see that, um, that they're just like the, the most barren landscape right now, having been, um, you know, that, that really short turf putting green as soon as they became mismanaged or, or just left uh, to go fallow, they, they burned and it's just Didn't like a... Didn't someone spray them somewhere along the line? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, um, you know, the, the, the two greens that I'm speaking about are removed from the, the, the real project. We're doing this uh, not because people are going to be sitting on these greens as watching a performance per se. Uh, we're doing it for environmental reasons for, for mitigation because we feel that they're, they're close to the water body and it's the right thing to do to remove um, the sediments. Um, we could have certainly, um, there's other management strategies in terms of kind of blockading them off to the public, uh, which we're doing in certain areas, and, um, but we didn't choose to do that with these particular greens because they're close to water bodies. We're actually removing those sediments and we quantify um, the amount of material that's going to be removed from those two golf greens. So that is part of our mitigation strategy removing the, the contaminated soil from those two greens and they will be naturalized with the seed mix that's specified on the plants. Um, the second is the invasive species removal in this 10-foot band around the perimeter of the pond that is denoted uh, on the plans. That's a new, uh, an edit to the, the last version of the plans that you saw. Now, um, a company called RES, they were the, um, the client's uh, ecologist as part of the seeker analysis. Um, they did uh, an in-depth uh, plant identification uh, review throughout the entire site as part of the seeker analysis, and they looked spe specifically at the pond uh, during that process, and they came uh, together with a complete plant list. And that's included in this report both uh, native and invasive. And what they found was that prim primarily the vegetation around the pond is, is native. Uh, and I think they found about nine invasives. But uh, the report has been submitted, um, RES's report to you in the past, uh, and it concludes really that the vegetation around the pond, surprisingly, um, is either you know mowed uh, down to the edge as part of the former golf course use or is a lot of native vegetation. Um, there is some invasives intermixed. We've identified uh, those, um, and we're planning on removing them. We're planning on removing them uh, via mechanical means. Um, we're hoping that will be successful. Um, there are a couple of invasives that may give us a little bit of issue, um, but we, in our, our management uh, and monitoring um, program, uh, which goes... Uh, for, for five to seven years, we feel that we can manage them uh, appropriately via mechanical means. We're hoping not to use the chemicals, but we do provide that option uh, in the report should we need to. Um, we do have that, I guess, plan B, should we need to spot treat uh, for some persistent invasives. Um, but it's not gonna be the whole 10-foot band. It's gonna be, and we, we detail in the report that uh, we're going to go, we're going to um, flag the, the invasives that need to be removed. They'll be identified in the field, and then they'll be um, mechanically removed either by hand labor or by a chain, um, chain a tractor, uh, however is deemed appropriate. And we lay out those methods in the report. Um, so then the, uh, those areas are, are then going to be immediately um, filled with topsoil uh, from the site. We have an excess cut or uh, 
of material from the from the project. So we'll use soil from the from the site to uh, bring those areas uh, back up to grade. We'll seed them with a native seed mix that's specified on the plans, um, sterile straw, and those areas will be stabilized. Um, for the planting area, when we drew down the water four feet, it's probably been a couple of years now that uh, the pond's been drawn down. Uh, it left about a plus or minus two foot band of exposed shoreline. It consists of sands, gravels, etc. cetera, uh, mainly void of vegetation, um, mainly void of invasive vegetation, importantly. Um, and that's the area that we're proposing to plant. Um, you know, thousands of plants, uh, all native, mostly plugs. We do have some gallon-sized plants intermixed. Uh, we do have some shrubs intermixed. Uh, we did try to revise the plant list uh, to include uh, some plants that we think would would uh, outcompete invasive should they, they kind of come into the fold. Um, that we kind of have the luxury uh, of be, being able to uh, drop the level of the pond to, to plant this this area. Um, um, we're going to use, as uh, Adam mentioned, a core log. That's a, could be a six, eight inch, ten inch uh, fibrous um, tube. Basically, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It gets staked into the ground. Uh, it's completely biodegradable. Um, and that will also give us the ability, should that shoreline be a little stony, to bring in some, some soil to provide a, a good planting media. Um, that would just stay in place and, and just biodegrade over time. Um, so that's kind of our strategy there. We have the, the greens, we have the invasive species removal, we have the planting area, um, and uh, we have a monitoring plan. We're committing to five years right off the bat. Uh, we identify how many times we're going to go out there uh, each year. It's more aggressive, more, more inspections uh, in the first year, and it, it tapers off as the years go on. Um, we're going to provide um, a baseline photograph, a uh, series of photographs at key locations, It'll be mapped uh, to you. And then uh, each year, or each time we go out there, we'll, we'll take those same, same photographs at those same locations to to give you documentation of both the planting areas and the invasives. We're gonna count our success base on, um, on uh, canopy coverage of the plants. Um, as Adam mentioned, we're, our goal is 85% survival rate on the plantings, no more than 15% uh, invasives in that 10 foot band. And- um, For how long? The, the, well, the, the we're committing to five years. So we're committing to five years, and then we're going to have to have a discussion whether, you know, if, we, if we're thinking, hey, we hit a home run here, we think if we think we, we should be able to terminate at five years. If it's still taking a lot of um, manual labor uh, to keep up with it, and uh, the plantings continue to need to be replaced, then we're we're saying that we'd go seven. Um, so that's an overview of the uh, the report. And we'd be happy to. Do we have the? Uh, I know it's preliminary, but do we have questions or comments? I just had a question. Um, are you going to try to remove some of the or all the golf balls in that zone or further into the pond? I mean, there's got to be a lot of golf balls there, and I don't know what happens. Are they the yours? You want us to? I could get them back. <laughs> there's a lot of mine in there. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's not something we talked about. Well, they break down. I don't know what happens. You know, if, like the creatures will start chewing on them, or you know, I just don't know if they're. If, I mean, I know they've been in there for a long time, and you know, animals have lived there. But yeah. if, if you're remediating it, are you just going to leave them there? If you the one thing I'll or, say, you know, from like a permitting standpoint, is if we got into the street, uh, into the pond itself, and we started disturbing soils, first those soils might have contaminants of their own yeah, no. um, and also we would have to go to the DEC to get permitting uh, because it's a it's a class B TS string right. but what about in the area that you're disturbing at least like you know I mean if you're disturbing it to put this buffer area in with the core rot logs yeah the, the DEC doesn't take them out or? the DEC doesn't require permitting for for planting only 
Yeah. And we're also going to be we're also going to be above right. the. But there's going to uh, be golf balls there too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we could certainly pick up the golf balls that are in the planting zone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's at least reasonable. Yeah, no, that's yeah. reasonable. What I worry about is a lot of ponds that were built here aligned with clay bed and night mm -hmm. or something else. I think when we've run into this where somebody started dredging and wasn't paying attention to that. So I, I would also say that the less we probably do to the sediment, not yeah. only because of contamination. But for I'd say I have a couple, a couple bags of golf balls when I did the wetland delineation. I did pick up a couple bags. So I, I did my, yeah, <laughs> my duty there. Did you have RR on it? But... <laughs> I'll have to go through for you. Other questions or comments? You know, it's I'm, very I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not absolutely certain of this, but I think that the golf club had somebody harvesting those things once in a while. It's possible. I'll check, but I, the, the, I think they were harvested. Possible. I know I've seen when I've gone kayaked out to the waterfalls in Constitution Marsh. Yeah. There are golf balls. They do travel. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Okay, Glenn. Is there anything that you would like to present? I, I, think, we, I think they've covered most most okay. of the stuff. I mean, we've ours, ours have been really technical responses to the to the plan to right. provide the things that you need. Yeah. I mean, I do feel it's important at the public hearing to just give a um, simple approach to what's being done in terms of mitigation. And this way we'll get public comment on that. If we didn't have that opportunity, we feel we wasted the trip. <laughs> and we'll do our best to try to keep everybody focused on that part. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Okay, it wasn't on the agenda, but do we want to talk a little bit about the solar ordinance or proposed? It is? Okay, I have the old agenda, so it is. Yeah. So how would you all like to do this? Should I give a little context of the local law? And then I brought a draft copy just to kind of record comments and thoughts as we go along. But Andy, how would you like to do a little bit of context for this um, first? Unless people would like it again, I think the context was brought in um, uh, Nat and who was the... Uh, Martha, Martha uh, Upton, the right. Climate Smart Coordinator. Yeah, sort of explain it. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I guess the only the only thing I'd say before just turning it over is, um, I, I think that the balance here, or at least I, I'll give a a little bit of context, which is, you know, we're in a situation where New York State has a law on the books to increase renewables to seventy percent by twenty thirty. And states are making those plans based on the 1.5 climate international treaty. So where we are right now in New York State is 30% renewables. So we're supposed to get to 70% to keep up with those climate targets. So that's just one bit of context because there's a ramp up based on the types of laws that states are passing. And at the same time, there's now money flooding the renewable energy development market from the Federal Inflation Reduction Act. So I guess that context here is uh, if local communities don't have solar policy, we're moving into a period that is very much going to look like a serious ramp up. And so that context is just to say we didn't, the town of Phillipstown didn't have a local law on the books related to solar energy siting and regulation. Uh, and so that's just the purpose of this effort. Um, you know, at the same time, because uh, Andy made a couple great points, at the same time that we're going to see this ramp up and this pressure at local community levels all over the place to develop renewables, you need to balance that with obviously protecting environmental resources and the communities that are doing it. So that's kind of what a local law is trying to do, is find that balance. And the only thing I'll say is, 
this draft, you know, we're just coming to the conservation board because there is many, many years of experience and expertise on this conservation board that I don't think is found on the town board as we're developing this local law. So we're coming to see, you know, what comes to your mind as you read this draft local law. Uh, and at the same time, I think that the main thing I would say is that, you know, while we have to kind of uh, protect things. We also have to make it enforceable. So we're trying to come up with a local law that's very streamlined. Um, we had a lot of discussions with Greg, um, the building department and code enforcement officer to educate us how, how he's regulating solar now uh, in practice. Um, and I would say, and Andy, this is a point you raised in an email, which I think you know, the most important decision uh, the committee looking at this probably made was to decide on two classes of solar in the town of Phillipstown. One be that guides kind of how we regulate it. One being what we call class A solar. And that's just any solar that's created where the energy produced is used on site by the property owner. Uh, and so under how the town is currently regulating that type of solar, it's seen as an accessory use. It's treated as an accessory use. So it follows the accessory use um, regulation. And then we kind of made a distinction uh, to class B solar, which would be any solar that's being built that's commercial in the sense that the energy produced is gonna be sold off of the property to customers, like community solar projects. Yeah, please, Scott. So how do you distinguish a lot of the, a lot of the solar is put back into the grid? Yeah. You're not, nobody's making money on it, but you're definitely not generating the solar, you know, the energy necessary that you're using or you're, unless you have excess. Yeah. I suppose. But. Yeah. So that's, I think that's the distinction we're making. If you're putting solar on your property and you're using all of those credits you get, Right. on your energy bill, right. then that is class A. That is seen as an accessory use. Right. If it's a large enough solar field that you have an excess which you're then selling to offsite customers through Central Hudson, that's called community solar, you're finding subscribers, you're selling, that becomes class B and that brings you into a special permitting process and planning board and that whole line. There's supposed to be kind of a more stringent regulatory oversight of that. And of that I, I don't know how you define that because it, like I have solar in my house uh, yeah. um, in Massachusetts and probably seven months of the year I generate excess um, that goes back into the grid and I technically get credits for it. And then but three months, not, what was that? You're not selling it to a third party, right? You're not selling it to a I'm third getting party. credits for it. I don't know if you're yeah, selling it. But they're credits that you're then using use on your own electricity bill. Yeah, I suppose that, that part is that part is true. But but my point is that I'm I'm generating excess probably seventy percent of the year, eighty percent of the year, maybe. Seventy five percent of the year. Okay. So it's a good question. I see so with this, if you were someone who was generating excess that you weren't gonna use later in the year on site, you're gonna have to submit and be um, recognized by Central Hudson to sell electricity as an electricity supplier. And at that point, you yeah. would become a commercial. It gets, it gets iffy because if I buy an electric car, then I'm no longer generating excess. Yeah. See, I'll, I'll go yeah. a little. I mean, yeah, what yeah. Scott brings up is interesting. I'm I'll, I'll, I'll note it, and, and I'll, it's, a, it's a good point. I'm, or if somebody else moves in. If yeah. You, or, or if I go from staying there for three months of the year to... 10 months of the year, yeah. it would change whether or not. Yeah, I mean, I think the real distinction is when you have to uh, apply and be accepted as a commercial elect electricity supplier. Okay. But I think it's, it's, it's a good point, Scott. Right, but it becomes, I look at it more from a physical standpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm very uncomfortable the way the law is written now talking about Class A and Class B. Mm -hmm. Because the Class A being used on site could be massive. We don't have a lot of industry in town, but there are certainly some industrial sites that could have a class A because they're using it themselves, mm -hmm. but it's massive in size. So talk through that, Andy, as an example. So in other so, words, yeah. I'm thinking with all I'm thinking, so in other words, it's not a great example, but yeah, uh, yeah. what is it, Magazino. Well, yeah, it's yeah. one of the bigger buildings in town. I don't yeah. think they use a lot of power, but they're big enough that their class A system 
might not go on a roof and it might be a very large system that takes up an acre or mm -hmm. more. But they're so using it all. They're using it all. So there needs to be some physical boundaries mm. and distinctions. Capacity. Mm. Well, it's, it's or more. Volume. It's, it's like I, volume. I'm, I'm thinking of size, footprint. Yeah, yeah. Size, yeah right. Well, 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 however you want to. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. putting it on a roof, I think, is radically different than having it, I guess I'm going to call it freestanding. Um, Ground and then yeah. once you go into mainly third party sellers, because I dealt with this at Poughkeepsie Day School. Mm hmm. Um, uh, a lot of these um, fields, particularly if like Central Hudson, who we were dealing with, feels it's viable enough, um, they're going to use eminent domain and basically bring in power lines, which I don't think we necessarily want. You know, I, the spirit of the law is great in mm -hmm. terms of, mm -hmm. you know, we want to become compliant. Yep. And B, it also says, you know, ideally using rooftops, brownfields, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, there's not a lot of that no. for class B. Mm -hmm. And I think the law is way too broad. I think mm -hmm. it really needs to look at physical characteristics in terms of size. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. about residential versus commercial? I mean, obviously yeah. a large commercial facility is commercial facility. So if it's mm -hmm. zoned a commercial facility, then maybe it automatically goes into B or something. Mm -hmm. But also the way the law is written right now as proposed is essentially that a large commercial facility could be allowed in any zoning district. And I don't think that meshes with our comprehensive plan whatsoever. No. Mm. No. So, so two. You were, we're kind of talking about two things. So, one, you're kind of bringing up the point: if there is a large enough property owner that is going to use all of the electricity produced on site, that just could be a loophole in the sense of yeah. it's low regulated, but they're building a large system. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I guess a question which I don't know the answer to would be: Does the you know the the zoning dimensional tables around accessory uses deal with that at all? Because any class A would be treated exactly like any other accessory structure, whether it's on the roof or whether it's in a field. Yeah. So if it's ground mounted, it has to follow the setbacks of any accessory use. It it would pro it would have to also follow the maximum footprint in square feet for non residential structures. So we have to look at that to kind of. I'm not an expert on that. But no, me neither. But it's I'm a good sort of looking at it because it's still, a, you know, our timber harvesting audience audience yeah. needs to be updated. Mm -hmm. But minor and major, the problem that's always existed was that you could do ten minor harvests to get around. Yeah. Doing a major by just breaking them up segmentally. I mean, to your point, and it's, I, I think it is revealing, like if we look at on the back of the law is the zoning dimensional table, and I think the point you're bringing up is a ground mount solar, which is a structure built not on, if we look at the maximum footprint in square feet for non-residential structures, which I think this would fall into, but we'd want to clarify, like it seems to be fine, except when, you know, you know rural conservation, 6,000 square feet. RR four thousand, but when you get to what's OC? Is that what commercial? What what's what does that stand for? Something commercial. Yeah, yeah. office commercial. It's the root isn't the root nine quarter. Commercial. It's office commercial. So if you get to root nine, office commercial is two hundred thousand square feet. So it's a you know it's a good point to look at right there, related to going down the accessory. Yeah, maybe so, you can come up with a that. formula for sizing, sizing it to the building. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the other thing I brought this up the last time was <clears throat> I've seen where the solar companies will come along and tell a customer, well, if you put this up, you're, you're going to make money on it because Central Hudson has to buy it back, which really isn't true. Mm -hmm. So what one person I know put it up, it didn't work well. So the solar company, because they figured it out in the winter. Mm -hmm. So the solar company came back and said, well, you got all those trees over there blocking it. So then they cut down a whole stand of oaks. Yeah. So there, there has to be like a balance, like if you're going to do this, how many trees are you going to cut down and what do you yeah. do? And then when summer came, it was roasting in their atrium, they couldn't even go out there. Yeah. And then the AC's kicking on, so it's kind of, it, it kind of... Yeah. <laughs> you defeat the purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask a question there, because we're on trees, and I knew this would come up. I mean, we inserted 
into this draft local law. If you go to, this doesn't have page numbers, but um, I think it's uh, three seven. I think it's within section six seven. Um, yeah, if you go to three environmental resources, A, B, C, and D, it's on the second to last page. There's a section in there that um, addresses tree cutting when you're putting in class B. I think it's worth looking at that. I mean, I have a note, how can this be strengthened? Uh, and I also have a note, may, this tree cutting section is only in class B, but it's not in class A. For So putting, I think the question is, how can that tree cutting be strengthened? And then it should probably apply to class A as well um, because yeah, a lot of solar developers come in and cut down a lot of trees. We don't really have a coherent, I don't think a very coherent town tree policy. No, it doesn't exist. No, but this begins to get us into that mm -hmm. realm, uh, which is not a bad thing. Um, but I'll note that Tony, because I think that should probably, do, do you all agree that that sort of tree cutting thing should be in the class A as well? No, no yeah. definitely. Yeah, okay. I have a question about what about leasing? People who lease solar panels, they don't and really. They pay a flat rate, and the the power that's generated goes back to the to the company. I, I right. like that because then when it comes time to decommission, they take the stuff away. Uh, no, I, I think it's yeah. a better deal. But my question is, how do you regulate it? Yeah. What, what what class is that? It is still anything is class A. Whether you're someone who's a property owner and you're leasing your panels, but you're using the electricity from those panels. Um, that is still class A because like me, I've got solar panels on, you know, on our house, the meter runs back, we get credit for them when they go forward. I'm using it all on site. I didn't have to apply to Central Hudson to be a commercial electricity supplier. Right. So it's just net that you're worried about. It, it, yeah. It whether it's leased. leased and it's when you're selling, selling, when you actually literally have to, Central Hudson has to register you, you're going and subscribing other customers and you're right. selling them electricity right. off of your site, which right. Central Hudson has to be aware of. Right. And that's a pretty clear line. Right? So I have a strange, maybe hybrid of A and B. Yeah. I don't know whether you thought about this. I don't know whether this is even a problem. Yeah. But um, what if you've got a, a place like Glassbury Court or the new Highlands Reserve, mm -hmm. right? And it's got a homeowners association and it's got kind of a common space. And mm. there is a decision to make that common space now into a solar. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. You know, then it's mm -hmm. going to property the homeowners, owners, the, yeah. pro the separate property owners, yeah. but the homeowners association now is either responsible or they're not responsible for maintaining mm -hmm. and managing the relationship. And that's a better example for Andy's is a yeah, classic. It is. Yeah. What's yeah. missing from this is... And you've also lost the, the green space. But you, yeah. you is what's grossly missing, whether it's A or B, is mm -hmm. the spatial impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, personally, I'm not concerned. This is just me personally mm -hmm. on a roof, and I'm not even so concerned about glare unless it were to be a traffic hazard. Mm -hmm. But I am very concerned whether it's A or B in terms of spatial mm -hmm. impact, just well, size. See, limited. I think yeah. There's a, but there's a balance, right? Yeah. Because we yeah. have to, you know, we we have to do something about our. You know, right, how, but how but I mean, energy. we identified the two issues primarily when we were talking about solar last time, which was which is habitat um, disturbance, which is what you're talking about, and then um, a disposal of, yeah, of solar panels talking? in the future. That, that's a big so one. anything that we can do yeah. that deals with either of those <clears throat> two things, we should do. Yeah. yeah. Um, those are really good points. Don't know how to do it though. <laughs> yeah. That's no, but but I, I think um, the fact that we we look at. Um, home mounted solar panels as distinct from from arrays mm -hmm. uh, ground mounted arrays i think that does address yeah. at least part yeah. one of those two points yeah i think it's very good terminology ground mounted arrays yeah we yeah so we do in here in the definitions you've got roof mounted versus ground mounted um and so they but that's not that's not a, a definition that distinguishes class a from class b we're saying that we, we want it, we think it should be used to distinguish Oh, ground mount? Yes, it's one of the primary things that we're, ish we're concerned with, right? I mean, unless I misunderstand what you're saying. I mean, that's a, I mean I'm, I'm, my only thought there would be there's a lot of ground mount that goes on that is small, 
small yeah. ground mount because people are in shaded homes. So I, I, I personally don't think ground making the distinction of class A versus class B by ground mount is a good distinction. I think a size distinction. No, but, well, it could, it could be size. both. It could be ground mounts greater than yeah, yeah, yeah. ground yeah. mounts greater than a quarter of an acre or whatever. Yeah, it is. yeah. And yeah. and my my question here is well, percentage of house that it's going to. But my point is, I think that you can address it through that. Yeah, yeah. through the side, through the side. I, I agree. I, I hear that. I hear that. With a little teeny house on it. Yeah. And I, I think the question I'm coming away with, which I don't know the answer to, is looking at this maximum footprint for non-residential structures, because that's what would apply to ground mount, and see if that does it. If it doesn't, it sounds like advice coming from here is there needs to be a size. Yeah. Um, okay, that's very useful. Uh, were there other things? Andy, you raised a point which... I think is a really good one. On class B, um, under the current law, it says it's permitted in all zoning districts. Right. So that's a, you know, there's a question there. Should solar, as we try to find this balance, should solar be permitted in all districts? I mean, obviously, when I look at the scenic overlay district. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's there's, not good. There's questions there, but this. Yeah. You know, but the, or if I look at the uh, the scenic protection overlay district, right? Do you want solar in those areas? But at the same time, that the way that zoning district, the scenic protection overlay district, is all land between the Hudson River and 9D. Is there any right? way to do like a sun exposure study and come up with like a, a layer for the town and then incorporate your kind of open space inventory, or not open space inventory, but scenic protection overlay, style overlay, and really hone down those focal areas within Phillipstown that could actually, based on some sort of scientific me metric, be the best locations. For, for solar. Time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, like a solar overlay. Yeah. yeah. I don't, but there's more to that. But yeah. Something that could, di like where you're not just drawing, a, you know. Yeah, yeah. the brush. technology gets better. That's it, true. You know. That's that that's gonna change, right? It's gonna, yeah. I mean, unless in terms you're, of the you're redoing it. Well, yeah, technology on so. I mean, now you've got things that are articulated, and you know, I mean, that you didn't have before. So yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I'm just trying to think of like a way to narrow down. I think what it's gonna come down to is more need to figure out what's an allowable footprint size. Mm -hmm. Right, and then within that, I think that once it gets over a f certain footprint size, and it could be as small as an eighth of an acre, certainly a quarter acre, I think there needs to be a permitting a, process. Well, well, not only well, there is a permitting process, but I think you need a full environmental impact statement. The the way that we handle clearing now, anything between two thousand square feet and twenty thousand square feet is only reviewed by me. If mm -hmm. there's no, if it's not attached to any other planning board application or conservation board application mm -hmm. or zoning board application, if it's over twenty thousand square feet, it comes solely to hear this board, and if it's not associated with any other project, I mean, is that any project you mean close to a wetland buffer or within a wetland it's buffer? Not even within a wetland buffer, they use the same Chapter ninety three wetlands permitting process in that land clearing code to administer land clearing. Well, for ground disturbance, right? Yeah, so it's cutting mm -hmm. any, like, essentially, if you were going to clear an area that's 15,000 square feet, I would, I could cut a permit and say, here's, if mm -hmm. they submit a wetlands application, even though it doesn't have anything to do with the wetland, yeah. that's how it's reviewed. And that's mm -hmm. related to tree clearing? or tree that's clearing. And, land, and, and grading. So well, wouldn't we call the amount of panels disturbance? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. So if yeah. someone came in with a 20,000 square foot project, yeah. that would get reviewed at this, by this board solely. If, mm -hmm. Unless it triggered some sort of zoning change mm -hmm. or a planning board, you need to go to the planning board. Or if we put in some sort of a tree clearing mm -hmm. restriction in this that says you can't clear right. X amount on right, a Right, but I don't know if you down. want to limit yourself to tree clearing. There's, there's plenty of old, old fields and stuff that's useful habitat that you might want to have the option of denying a, a development on. So let's... So to try to understand this, and, and you put the limit on the time, but this is very useful because it's thinking through all aspects of this. If, um, so if someone was building a class B uh, and, and putting the size issue to the side, 
they would have to go through a special permitting process, issue site plans to the planning board, probably have to do an environmental impact statement, correct? Mm -hmm. As part of that. So right now, if we deal with the size issue, then anything above a certain size, whether it's A or B, could go into the site permitting process, which would deal with this problem, or anything class B alone could go into the site permit. But it would, that would address a lot of it, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would address a lot. I mean, the other okay. thing okay. is in terms of your habit, <clears throat> within the proposed code, there is decommissioning. Yeah. But if you're dealing with most particularly a B class system, that is a ground array, mm -hmm. on top of decommissioning, there should be habitat restoration. Mm -hmm. Because meadows, you know, are not, yep. because essentially you end up with a meadow of some sort. And there, I know there is literature and people that have studied, yep. you know, a uh, plan from wildlife populations that can coexist in a field if it's designed properly. But once that field might be decommissioned, and it's no longer solar, because mm -hmm. we probably have better technologies mm -hmm. at a certain point. Um, what happens? Who's going to repair that? Mm -hmm. Yep. You mean restore that restore meadow that. or yeah, exactly. forest? Yeah. yeah, because meadows, as we know, meadows really don't exist here unless you're going to make it. Is there it. a way to do like a bond or something like that with decommissioning? Yeah, I think, what does it say? There is a bond in here. The amount of the bond or security shall be 115% of the cost of removal and site restoration. Mm -hmm. The cost of removal and site restoration. But maybe that site restoration has to be a little bit more explicit. Yeah. Yeah. So also, if, it, if someone's going to do it, then transfer to someone else, mm -hmm. like the property, and that happens all the time, mm -hmm. there might be some kind of deed restriction or something like that in there where you didn't tell me I had to do this, you mm -hmm. know, so this way it's, it's no, transparent the for the guy. The law goes the land. The, the law that. applies to the property regardless of transferring the property to another person, so. Well, the a lot of times even here we've had people, there's been a lot of properties that have been different owners in and out of here. Mm -hmm. So this, the guy, someone else comes in and this, well, the guy before you was supposed to do, well, I had no idea. Mm. You know, and then we're reviewing it again, and then like like Andy said one time, oh, we've been there a bunch of times, several owners. Yeah, unfortunately, that's. Yeah, so I mean, so but if it's, but if it's in the if, if it's written in there, right. when the if lawyers do the thing when they transfer the house, they can say, hey, don't no, don't forget about sense. this. Yeah, I, mean, just, you, I don't know how it's. I mean, gone. it should go. I mean, all yeah. of this legally it should already, but this yeah. is an extra step. Yeah, yeah but I think, right. I, think yes, okay. I think Steve Gabba might be able to come up. Okay. I guess it, I think it's most important for large A and B that something has to go should be in the D. Yeah, because mm -hmm. if somebody buys yeah. this, I don't want to use sense. that crap. Yeah. It just goes in. Great point. Yeah. 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 And is there any way to address the disposal issue? That would the be what it's issues in the of the panels the itself. Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah, I mean, if we're if we're talking batteries. about decommissioning, yeah, that's, that's what that's what decommissioning. The batteries is. inside yeah. the house is is another thing. You know, because all this talks about is decommissioning and removing the solar energy system. You're saying explicitly how it is to be disposed of. Well, yeah, right. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. being a little bit more explicit, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Because any local dumps around, they won't take that stuff. It's like, it's like I said, if those are the, the two main issues, yep. we might as well try to approach them. Yep. I'm, I'm sure okay. other towns have, got, have done something similar to this. They have. So, I mean, this is this is based, I mean, we did not create this out of thin air. We based it on the nicer to the New York State model local law, but obviously our community is different, so it's changing. And we looked at a number of other kind of best, best practice local laws. Um, Anything else? This was all really, really useful and strengthening. So. What about some okay. of the, um, like the community solar and the, the other uh, classification, like the town has uh, contracted with suppliers in the Midwest and, you know. The CCA? Yeah. Yeah. So is there going to be any type of additional beefing up of the laws or protection for the town so we don't have issues like we've had in the past with some of those? You mean that, that electricity supply contract? Yeah. I mean, the only thing that we did, so the town is jo in joint litigation against that supplier. Um, 
and we're going to get us, uh, some bit of the penalties. But besides that, we just tightened up the CCA review of the bids and the contracts and the type of companies that we're willing to contract with. And that's as, as far as we brought it. So with the yeah. models that you've seen, there's no like best practices in other communities for that type of partner? I mean, that's basically what they're doing, which is like putting any like prospective CCA supplier under a much more stringent financial stress test. So they have the they have the financial standing to, you know, to back up the contract, which this company uh, didn't. So I think one, one thing you might want to, if it's possible, is to why we're doing this type thing. So so people, you know, they don't want to do something like, oh, I want to get solar. Oh, no, yeah. the town will rake you over the coals. Don't even do it. Yeah. But it, like an educational component so people don't, so people, you know, because we want to do solar. Yeah. But we also, had, we want to protect the environment. At the yeah. same time, we want to make it a little easy for people. Yeah, exactly. But if they understand why there's a law in effect, it isn't just, we, we, want to, we want to screw you because you want to put in solar. Yeah, yeah, jealous yeah. jealous or whatever. It's yeah. But if, we, if there's a, something written out as why we did okay. this. I've it got does a, exist in the ordinance. I mean, you could do an educational component like, yeah. you know, put something in the You're saying something a little bit more heartfelt, maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah, a little yeah. more, you know, straight. Yeah. So I'm just going to tell you. So I've been, um, so I've been working with uh, the Garrison School, and I reached out to Haldane and Manitou. And so there are students, Garrison School is completed, eighth grade students are drafting a preamble to this, oh, which good. says why. Nice. And Haldane is as well, because it's, it's a really cool opportunity for them to have their voices mm -hmm. in the local law. So to your point, let's see what they come nice. up with. Great. You know, they could do a TikTok video. What? They could do a TikTok video. <laughs> at, least there'll be, at least there'll be people at the town board meeting when we talk about it, because there'll be students who have worked on it. Um, all right, I know I kept you late, but I really, this is very, very um, helpful. Thank you for taking the time to offer those comments. Oh. Yeah. Do you have any other unfinished business? No. Okay, I'm good. I'd like a motion. Uh, uh, oh, hearing. yes, public hearing. So, essentially what's going to happen is we have a public hearing next Thursday. Thank you. Um, next Thursday, next Thursday like, as many of you can eight, attend, 18? please do. Is it? What's that? 18? 18? Yep, it's Thursday, 7.30. Um, that will be first. Um, and where will that be? Here. Right here. Here. Um, Where's everybody going to sit? <laughs> well, no, we're going to... Isn't it isn't a joint public it's hearing? It's a joint public <laughs> hearing. <laughs> so I, I'm letting... <laughs> don't yeah, don't cry be in front of the public. We'll be in the front. Yeah. Yeah. I'm letting yeah. Neil Zuckerman, who's the chair of the planning board, since they're the lead agency, um, essentially decide how this is being done. Well, Lou's not sitting on my lap, but they so, are now. <laughs> most of you are going to sit up front, you know, Basically, Neil had asked me, okay, don't you have a deputy? Asked me, I said, no. Well, you should have the longest standing member here. That's Lou, but I know Lou, if I were to ask him to sit up here with me, well, we'll my, give my, you a badge. So, you get a nice little badge. The longest standing member is MJ. So she'll stand up with me. Right now, we're both the planning board and the conservation board are at a little bit of a disadvantage. This was given to us so late. Yeah. I mean, I was hoping that essentially we would have had at least a draft permit, you know, a proposed draft mm -hmm. permit. We're not going to have that. So I think really the most important thing is let the public talk about it. And I think between, um, and if anybody has anything to say when this goes on, please say it. But I think between myself and Neil, we're, when it comes to the uh, conservation board, the wetland part of this, it's really just to focus in on that. It's not whether you like Shakespeare or not. Yeah, right, right. You know, I mean, we've done similar projects to this. This is bigger, um, and I think there are a lot of ways this can be improved. But well, I think we're going to end up. This is on the website, up. so every yes. every resident has access to yes. this document. Yes. <laughs> so that's so, important. And that's why I was asking. I think his name Jan Johansson. Do I have it right? Jan. Yeah. Jan Johansson. Um, you know, that I thought he should present, you know, a, a truncated yeah. version so that the public has an idea of what's going on. Oh, okay, okay.
Okay. You know, and if need be, what I'll say, and I think Max can jump in, you know, we want your comments. We have done projects while small or similar to, similar to this where, yes, we're encroaching on a wetland buffer, but we're improving it at the same time. Right. So, and we'll see where we go from there. Um, we're not, go but we're, with what we have, we're not even anywhere close to being able to put together a draft permit. So we're going to end up coming back in May and start discussing what a draft permit would look like. Um, I know that I've had questions, well, why even draft a permit when the site plan has not been accepted by the planning board? Mm -hmm. um, I went back to the town code and the town code within chapter 93 says that we need to permit this either simultaneously or before. So I think it's going to be simultaneously at a certain point in time when we get there. And we'll be, we'll be drafting our permit language based on that public feedback, which actually yes. will be kind mm -hmm. of, you know, yeah. I mean, that's a nice, robust process. Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, basically for the two sections, because there's also more comments on the site plan, 90 minutes is going to be devoted to that. Um, if all the comments have, and the sign-in sheet is going to be, you could talk about the site plan, you could talk about the um, wetland permit, or both. Roughly a three-minute limit. And if we don't get through everything in 90 minutes, you know, the... You might continue it? There will be continued. 7.30? 7.30. And once our section is done, you know, we're free to go. Mm -hmm. So... So will they, will they focus at conservation first and then we're not? Um, I forgot. You, which is first? I think site plan is first. Sign in, but then the planning board has more things on their agenda after. Oh. But I believe the way the public notice was written, and I'm assuming we're going to hear to that, um, I don't know if uh, Glenn Watson and company is going to present any more vis-a-vis -vis the site plan, or it's just going to be public comments, and that's what I'm going to gather. Then, um, and if they're not going to present anything, then I think it would make sense, and I'll need to speak to uh, Neil, that probably uh, Mr. Johansson should present early on because some of the public, I think, is not necessarily going to read this or read it properly, but going to have comments, and I'd like mm. to focus it so it's constructive, so we come out with something that's useful. There is never a guarantee that people will be informed before they get right. comments. <laughs> so. Okay, with that, and thank you for reminding me, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everybody.